Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord this morning. Amen, amen. The praise and worship team did not know what I was going to preach today when they prepared. But we are in line together today. The Lord has a word for somebody. I want you to hear it again. My enemies want to fight with me. They want to go to war. But I won't lose a single thing. For the battle is the Lord's. Amen. I'm looking up. I'm looking up. Victory is on its way. The enemy is defeated. Death could not hold you down. You came out of the grave. And because you're victorious, I'm going to be victorious in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, it's fun to preach when the atmosphere is like this. When the presence of the Lord is in the room, when worship is activated. Amen. Amen. I also want to say hello to Emsley and family. I was in Roatan. They took us all over the place in boats and buses. And when my Apple Watch hit the bottom of the ocean, he said, we can find it. Jump in. Go, have it. Go for it. And we found it. And, uh, and uh, through, yeah, the, if you've never been to Roatan, the water is so clear. If you lose your Apple Watch, you can find it on the bottom. So we're so glad they are here. They were with us the whole time. And uh, it, that's so exciting. So if you wouldn't mind turning your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. I said uh, at nine o'clock this morning, sometimes, sometimes uh, pastor will remind me, I, I should know, but sometimes he'll remind me, hey, brother BB, you're preaching on Sunday morning and I'll go, ooh, okay, <laughs> help Lord, come to my rescue. And then other times you feel like the Lord has laid something on your heart and you are just waiting for an opportunity. You're waiting for the Lord to say, hey, now is the time. And I feel like that's where we are today. Uh, we've already had a wonderful service at nine o'clock. As I mentioned, every, every song the praise team sang today was directly in line with what the Lord has laid on my heart. So uh, you ought to expect God to touch you today. You ought to expect a move of the Holy Ghost today. Let me tell you something. If you will respond when your faith is mixed with worship, when you believe and you worship, the presence of God can move in and God can reach down and begin to touch and move in your life. And so uh, you ought to determine in your heart that's what you're going to do today. Amen. Second Chronicles 29, 1 through 5. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 5 and 20 years old. And he reigned 9 and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the place. Amen. I want to give just a moment of clarification. It references that Hezekiah's father was David. If you've read through the book of Samuel and Kings, you'll know that uh, Hezekiah was not a direct descendant of David. It was many generations that passed. Hezekiah's actual biological father was Ahaz. Uh, when the scripture says that he, he, his father, David, it's referencing his spiritual guide, his example, the, the, the king that he wanted to model his rulership and leadership after. So that, that is an important piece of information as we move forward. And I wanted to share that from the onset. This morning, I want to preach to you from that passage we just read and this title, When the Enemy Arrives. When the enemy arrives. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. 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 As you can tell from our reading this morning, Judah has been in a season of spiritual darkness. Hezekiah's father, Ahaz, had been king for 16 years. And throughout his reign, he had, according to 2 Chronicles 28, 
He had walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He sanctified also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. And another historical piece of information at this time. Uh, at this point in history, Israel had divided into two kingdoms. Uh, once David and then his son Solomon had passed from the scene, Israel had a revolt against Solomon or the sons of Solomon. And the kingdom was divided into the southern kingdom went by the name of Judah. That's where Jerusalem was. And the northern kingdom uh, continued with the name of Israel. It would later become Samaria and and, but neither of these kingdoms uh, continued down the path that they should completely. Israel completely abandoned the Lord and they had no uh, godly kings come to power to lead the nation of Israel. And with this lack of spiritual leadership, the nation of Israel declined and declined until disaster took place. Judah fared a little better. There were seasons when a ungodly pagan-like king would come to power in Judah and Judah would begin spiraling downward into the depths of paganism and idolatry and sinfulness and then he would pass off the scene and the next king would come to power and often scripture would say he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and this king would rise to power names like like Hezekiah and and, uh, and and as he would rise to power he would reestablish the kingdom of God he would reestablish sacrifice and, 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 and Judah would have a revival an upward tick an upward spiral and things would go well and then this cycle continued on and on and on under the leadership of Ahaz, the kingdom had gone downward and it reached the lowest point that each time either Judah or Israel would reach the point of child sacrifice, it would be considered the lowest point and judgment would be sent on Israel and Judah. But, but now Hezekiah has come to, uh, to rule and Ahaz would make league with pagan kings and who wanted the destruction of Israel and Judah. He also disbanded the priesthood and shut up the temple and destroyed the sacred ornaments of worship. Because of this, the Bible says the Lord brought Judah low. The Edomites, the Philistines, the Assyrians had invaded Judah. They had taken away captives and conquered cities. Judah would become a vassal state for the Assyrian empire and would have to pay heavy taxes to this pagan and brutish kingdom for the rest of Ahaz's life. And once Ahaz died, his son Hezekiah assumed the throne. And as we read a moment ago, he immediately reversed course on almost everything his father had done. Where Ahaz did what was right in his own eyes, Hezekiah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Where Ahaz disbanded the priesthood and shut up the temple, Hezekiah reinstated the priesthood and rebuilt the temple. Hezekiah had no positive example from his father. There wasn't a robust religious environment to shape Hezekiah's life. And yet he chose to serve the Lord. We in 2021, we do our very best to be uh, sensitive and caring and, and understanding that people are raised in different environments. And sometimes people that commit crimes or join gangs or, or make foolish, terrible decisions, that they came from difficult backgrounds and challenges and they didn't have the positive examples and poverty and, and broken homes can lead. And we try to be gentle and understanding and help guide and lead and give other avenues and ways for people to express themselves themselves other than than criminal behaviors and and we understand that people in those situations need help and and Hezekiah wasn't necessarily in that situation but Hezekiah didn't have positive examples he didn't have he didn't have godly role models he didn't have a father that followed in the path of the Lord and and Hezekiah said I, I know that I don't come from the best situation but but I'm just gonna make up in my mind nobody's expecting it out of me nobody's expecting anything better than what my daddy was 
was. I, I'm an at-risk young person. I ought to follow in his footsteps and be a pagan, drunk, alcoholic, drug addicted, lying, cheating, stealing. But I've made up in my mind, even though nobody expects it out of me, I'm going to walk with the Lord. I'm going to do what's right in the Lord's sight. I'm going to change my family tree. I'm going to do something better with my life. Don't let the labels that this world puts on you rule your future. You can say, I will not be a victim of my past. I will not be a victim of my heritage. I will not be held captive by somebody else's decisions and somebody else's mistakes. I will trust in the Lord. Hezekiah brought revival to Judah. He not only ceremonially reopened the temple, but he also reestablished the Passover. Can you imagine Judah, where the temple was, where the Ark of the Covenant had been, where David had sat on the throne for a generation? They had not celebrated the feast of Passover. And Hezekiah sent to all of Israel, and Judah, he sent, he sent messengers into the northern kingdom. He wasn't even the king of Israel. He said, go tell everybody. Go tell everybody. He wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh. That they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. To keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. And just for those who may not know the story that well. Israel was in bondage and slavery in Egypt. They were bound for for, for a generation, for generations, they were held captive by the Egyptians. And God sends Moses as a deliverer. And God sends with Moses his mighty power and his miracle signs and wonders. And ten plagues that, that would cripple the nation of Israel. And Pharaoh would say, I want to get rid of these people. But then his heart would harden. He'd say, no, I'm not going to let them go. And, and, and Moses would say, let God's people go. And they'd say, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to let them go. And then the tenth plague was going to come. And Moses gathered the congregation of Israel together. And he said, listen, the, the spirit of the Lord is going to move through Egypt tonight. And he's going to move through Goshen tonight. And and judgment is going to come. And the firstborn son of everyone in Egypt is going to die. Unless, unless you take the blood of a spotless lamb. And unless you take that blood and you apply it to the doorposts of your house. And when you do and the spirit of the Lord comes into the camp. The Bible said that God would told them when I see the blood. I will pass over you. And that's where the name Passover comes from. I will pass over you and judgment will go somewhere else and, and that's why they celebrated for generation to generation and still today but in Ahaz's day they weren't celebrating and Hezekiah said it ought not be so we're gonna set up Passover again he brought to the forefronts of the mind of the people of Judah we didn't always we weren't always in charge of our lives we were once slaves. We were once in bondage in Egypt. We were once held captive by a cruel taskmaster, bound in chains and not in our own land. But the blood, but the blood made a way for us. Hezekiah said, we can't forget where we came from. If it wasn't for the blood, we would still be bound. If it wasn't for the blood, we would still be in Egypt. If it wasn't for the blood, the whips would still be cracking and the enemy would still be ruling. But when God saw the blood, he passed over. Let me tell you something. The fastest way to have a personal revival is to be reminded of where you once were and where the blood has brought you to. You might be thinking I haven't got it all together, but you've come a mighty long way. No, you're not perfect. You're not righteous. You're not holy, but you're not bound anymore. You're standing on your own two feet. You're walking to the beat of Jesus's drum. You have victory on the horizon. You got hope. Amen. Amen. Sometimes I admit, I, I apologize for this, but 
Sometimes I can, like you, sit through a church service. I'm thankful to be there. I enjoy the music and the singing and the preaching and seeing all the pretty people and shaking hands and high-fiving and telling jokes. And sometimes I can go through an entire Sunday without really having a dynamic or exuberant emotional outpouring. But when I get reminded of the blood, when I get reminded of the cross, when I get reminded of the bondage that I once was in, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in and shed a little light from heaven. It filled my soul. Oh, when we start singing about the cross and we start singing about the blood and we start preaching about the nails and the crown of thorns, something stirs up inside of me. I once was lost. Once like a bird in prison, I dwelt. No freedom from the sorrow I felt. But Jesus came and he listened to me and glory to God. He set me free. I wish I had a witness in the house this morning. I wish I had, a, I once was lost. I once was bound, but now I'm free. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that saved me. I wish I could preach it like I feel it, but I'm running out of breath. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. I know it was the blood that saved me. The temple is open. The priests are, are ministering. The sacrifices are going up. The blood is being applied. Offerings are being given. Judah is in revival. <laughs> Judah began celebrating. They began giving. And wouldn't you know it, the enemy doesn't like it when we have revival. The enemy don't like what's going on today. He's scared. There's some folks in here about to break loose and get some victory. And I don't like it. There's some folks in here that are about to break loose and get some joy back and some peace back. And he don't like it. And he don't want it. So they mobilize troops when we start rebuilding walls, opening gates and welcoming the wayward home and investing in the kingdom the enemy he gets stirred up you ever wonder why you struggle now more than you did before you came to god you weren't struggling then you were just bound you were just obedient you just followed your unruly instincts and it was leading you down a path you didn't want to be on and so finally one day you turned it was hard it was difficult and every step of the way, the enemy's saying, don't go that way. Don't walk with God. Give in to your lower, baser instincts. Don't deny your flesh. And you're saying, but I got to walk with the Lord. And sometimes it's a struggle. And sometimes the harder we worship. And sometimes the more we give. And the more faithful we are, the more the enemy fights against us. And that's what happened in Hezekiah's day. Second Chronicles 32 and 1 says... After these things and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered into Judah. And he encamped himself against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. Sennacherib looks down at Judah and sees worship back and freedom back and sacrifices back. And the temple is open and the priests are leading. The people are giving and he decides, I'll take that. I've taken it before. I'm going to take it again. Not only that, Hezekiah said, hey, let, let Sennacherib know. The tax that my daddy paid, we ain't paying that no more. We work too hard. We fight too, strong, we fight too much. We ain't giving up what we got. And Sennacherib don't care for this. He, he likes, uh, the enemy likes holding us in bondage. 
The enemy doesn't want us giving a, uh, getting back what he stole. And this is what will happen in our life. The minute you decide to take a step towards the Lord, the enemy will mobilize against you. Satan and all of his evil forces will work in overtime to stop you from having victory, to stop you from having revival and stop you from regaining what you've lost. And so today we're going to talk about what to do when the enemy arrives. There are two things you need to do to let them know. First, you need to stand on your feet, square your shoulders, reach deep down into your soul and tell fear and anxiety and depression and doubt and discouragement and sickness and pain and suffering and loss and bankruptcy and divorce. You need to look it right in the eye and say, devil, you've come too late for me. I'm already in revival. I've already been reminded of the cross. I've already been faithful to the house of the Lord. Oh, devil, you should have killed me when you had a chance. You should have killed me on that bar stool. You should have killed me in that homeless shelter. You should have killed me laying in that gutter. But you let me escape. And now I'm in the house of the Lord. And I'm a little bit stronger. And I'm a little bit wiser. And I got a family worshiping with me. You've come too late. Oh, come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. You've come too late, devil. I don't have it all right. I don't got it all figured out. But I'm walking with the one who does. And he's going to lead me. And he's going to guide me. And his word's going to be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Somebody else say, you've come too late. You've come too late. The doors of the church are swung open wide. The priests are preaching. The singers are singing. I'm in the house of the Lord. Some of you got a testimony that I don't have today. Some of you got a testimony that I can't. That I can't relate to. But you ought to tell the devil you should have finished the job. You should have finished me off when I had alcohol problems. And drug addiction. You should have ended me. That sickness, that breakdown, that divorce, that bankruptcy, that betrayal, that abandonment should have finished me off. The lies, the cheating, the failures, the embarrassment, the shame should have been my undoing. But here I am. Here I am. You've come too late. Here I am. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. We're about to get some victory in the house. We're about to get some victory in the house. Somebody's about to get some boldness. Somebody's going to look the enemy in the eye and say, not today. Not in my house. Not in my family. I've got victory in Jesus. Hear me. The enemy does not expect you to resist. Hezekiah's father Ahaz had offered no resistance to Assyria. Sennacherib expects when he rattles the chains and brandishes his swords, Hezekiah will tuck tail and run just like previous kings had. But Hezekiah does not respond like Ahaz. Our text read this morning, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He said, I don't identify with Ahaz. I identify with David. And if I don't know if you know about David, but he had a real problem with smart aleck Philistines. He had a real problem with uncircumcised enemies. And he told them, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. You got a son of David on your hands. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm going to fight. I'm going to be victorious. Hezekiah responded like a warrior. He responded like a man after God's own heart. You may not have come from that perfect family. Your family may have a history of failure. 
And the enemy expects the same challenges that overwhelm mama and daddy to overwhelm you and to stop you in your season of revival. But you need to get deep down in your soul a response to the enemy. You have come too late to stop me. The weapon may be formed, but it's not going to prosper. You may think you've got a way, but I've got a way of escape. You may think you've got me hemmed in on every side, but the Lord will raise up a standard against you. Sennacherib just waiting. All right, he's going to fold any second now. He's going to wave the white flag and start paying them taxes again. But Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles 32, stands on the porch of the palace. And he looks at the people and he says, be strong and courageous. Be not afraid or dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. And so what you talking about? They got a big old army. They got lots of swords and spears. I wish you could open your eyes and see. There's angel armies. There's the host of the army of the Lord surrounded about them. There's victory on its way. Verse 8 says, with his arm of flesh, talking about Sennacherib, with his carnality, with his flesh, he wants to attack us, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves on the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. He said, don't you worry. The Lord is with us. Let me tell somebody today, the Lord is with you. The Lord is going to fight your battle. And he's not just going to get in the fight. He's going to win the fight. He's undefeated. He's never had an off night. He's never had a single round where he lost. He's never had a bad day. You got the champion of champions. The king of kings. The Lord of lords fighting for you. Sennacherib was not expecting to find a vibrant, worshipful, committed, bold, steadfast Jerusalem. So 2 Chronicles 32 tells us Sennacherib sent messengers to Jerusalem. And they begin to rail against God and against Hezekiah. They say, don't let Hezekiah convince you everything's going to be all right. Hezekiah says to remain faithful, to continue worshiping. But he's lying to you. Drought's coming and famine's coming. And death is coming. And the sword is coming. And you better just quit now. You better just wave the white flag. You know what? If you listen real closely with the ears of the Lord, you can hear those voices here today. And they're saying, you're feeling encouraged, but it ain't going to work. You're feeling inspired, but it ain't going to work. You can't trust this word. It works for other people, but it don't work for you. You're never going to get joy back. You ought to just go, why, why, why prolong the inevitable? Just, just throw in the towel. Just quit. Don't trust Hezekiah. Don't trust the word of the Lord. Verse 11 says, they said it like this. Doth not Hezekiah persuade you to give over yourselves to die by famine and by thirst, saying the Lord our God shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Hath not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying ye shall worship before one altar and burn incense upon it? Know ye not what I and my fathers have done to, unto all the people of the other lands? Were there gods of the nations of those lands anyways able to deliver their hand, lands out of my hand? They shouted in their arrogance. Judah, don't trust Hezekiah. Don't trust God. We've conquered many nations. And none of their gods were ever able to save them. Verse 15 says, now therefore... Let not Hezekiah deceive you nor persuade you. You on this man or neither yet believe him for no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of my hand and out of the hand of my fathers. How much less shall your God deliver you out of my hand? I wonder if this taunt and threat had the opposite intended effect on Hezekiah that they wanted. 
I wonder if Hezekiah thought, man, if this thing's going to be about swords and spears and shields and arrows, oh, we're in trouble. We're outnumbered. They got us hemmed in on every side. But then somebody said, hey, it ain't about swords and spears. This is about gods. Hezekiah said, now, wait a second. You need to know something, Sennacherib. Our God ain't like their gods. Hey, you've come too late and our God ain't like their gods. Oh, their gods are confined. Their gods are made of molten images and, and wood and stone, but not our God. Oh no, we got a different kind of God. You done messed up Sennacherib. You made this about the Lord. And when the Lord is on our side, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. When the enemy comes in like a flood, our God doesn't cower and whimper. He raises up a standard against them. There are two things you need to let the devil know. You have come too late. And our God is not like their gods. Our God was not carved from stone or wood. Our God has ears that hear and eyes that see. Our God is not a sun God or a moon God. Our God is not the God of a sea or the God of the sky. Our God has all power in heaven and in earth. Our God fills all the world with his majesty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Sennacherib, you are mistaken. Our God is not like other gods. Our God fills all time and space. Our God sits on the throne of heaven and earth is his footstool. With just his spoken words, he created the sun and the moon and the earth and the stars. He breathed life into me. He gave me a second chance. Our God is not like other God. You've defeated nations with a pantheon of gods, with multiple gods who had their seasons and who had their months and who had their jobs and who had their regions. But that isn't our God. You can't outflank him. You can't outsmart him. You can't outtrick him. There's nothing you can do to escape the eyes of the Lord. He is, he is an army around about us. Never have I seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. No, no, he's fighting for us and he will win. Our God never grows weak or tired. Our God cannot be tricked. He never loses. He never stumbles. And he never fails. We sang about it this morning. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. My enemies want to go to war, but the battle is the Lord's. This reminds me of a few stories. First, just quickly, reminds me of when Elijah's on Mount Carmel and they've built their altars and these priests are sacrificing. They're singing and they're chanting and they're dancing and they're cutting themselves and they're jumping and they're shouting. And Elijah, my dude, he's, he's going... Sing a little louder. Try a little harder. Shout a little longer. He said, maybe your God's on vacation. Maybe he's taking a nap. Maybe, he, maybe he's out of season right now. Maybe he's on sabbatical. But keep trying, fellas. But my God's not like your God. He don't take days off. And he don't sleep nor slumber. He doesn't grow weak or tired. His arm is not too short. His ear is not too heavy. Yeah, anytime I call, he is closer than the mention of his name. But this is the one I really like. First Kings tells us the story. Syria has invaded. First Kings 20, they've invaded Israel. And Israel, they gave him a good old-fashioned whooping. Sent him back to Syria. And all the Syrian generals gather up and they say, man, we got whipped. 
Somebody got an idea. They said, hey, listen, their God is the God of the mountains. Next time, let's fight them in the valleys. Their God is strong when they're on top of the mountain. Their God is strong when everything's going right. Their God is strong when they're healthy and when they're fed and when there's money in the bank and, and when the seasons are right, their God is strong. But if we can drag them down in the valley, if we can get them down in the valley, their God, he's not the God of the valleys. And so God whispers in the ears of the prophet. He said, go tell the king. We ain't fighting in the mountains this time. We're going to fight him in the valley. Because the devil needs to know. I'm not just the God of the mountains. I'm the God of the valley. I'm not just the God of the day. I'm the God of the night. I'm not just the God of the springtime. I'm the God of the winter. I'm the God in the good times. And he's still God in the bad times. When things go wrong, he'll make them right. He's not just in a mountaintop. He's not confined to Olympus. He's a, he is a God of every season. He is a God of every day. He is a God that never fails. Our God is not like their God. Second Kings 19 tells us the conclusion of this story in greater detail. Sennacherib, he is stunned. He is shocked. I did not expect you to stand up to me. You don't really act like your old weasel dad. What, what, what happened? Figured you'd have quit by now. Hezekiah said, no, no, no. We're still here. We're not quitting. And the Lord is on our side. And if you would have came when dad was in charge, we, we would have been in trouble, but we've been in revival. We've been praying and fasting and sacrificing and giving. And, and you, I think you come too late, Sennacherib. And I think you miscalculated some God is on our side and he ain't like them other gods. And I think you messed up. And Hezekiah and Sennacherib gets mad. And he writes, he writes a nasty letter. A couple nasty letters. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut out your eyes and tear off your ears and hang you from the walls. And I'm going to steal your women and kill your children and ride off with your horses. And I'm going to burn your city down. And there ain't nothing your God can do about it. And it's going to be bad. And oh, I'm going to get you. Hezekiah goes, oh, man. Okay. He takes the letters. And he goes to the house of the Lord. The Bible says he goes to the altar and he spreads them out on the altar. And he says, Lord, you see what they're saying. Lord, you see what he's saying. And this is a battle I can't win with slings and bows and arrows. And this is a battle I can, but Lord, you can fight my battle. And Lord, you can, oh, today, some of you, you've heard all the negative reports. You've heard all that the enemy's going to do. But there is an altar and there's a Lord. And you can stand to your feet and you can take the lies of the enemy. And you can march down to this altar and you say, Lord, I give it to you. Fight my battle. Lord, I give it to you. Come on, stand to your feet. You might be thinking, I can't win. I can't beat this thing. I've tried. I've done everything I can. I've tried every remedy, every option. I, I've done everything I know to do. All the self-help books and all the gurus and all the trainers and all the, all the coaches. I, I've tried it all and nothing works. I might as well quit. I might as well give up. But you got one more option. You can get into the house of the Lord. You can get down to an altar somewhere. You can spread it out. Lord, the doctor says I'm going to die. And the lawyer says I'm finished. And my bank account is closing. And my job is about to let me off. And, and the enemy says I'm foolish and I'm going to die and I'm going to fail. But Lord, you are not like other gods. And you pull victory from the jaws of defeat. And 
you come in when there doesn't seem to be a way you you make a way where there doesn't seem to be a way and there is no shadow you won't light up or mountain you won't climb up or door you won't kick down or wall you won't overcome there's no battle you can't defeat the Bible says Hezekiah goes to prayer he says Lord I need you to save me. Remember he had said there are more for us than against us. I get the image that Elisha had when he told, when he asked the Lord to open the eyes of his servant and his servant said there was a whole host of armies of angels. But God that evening tells one angel, he says, come on, break ranks, buddy. No, 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 the rest of y'all can stay put. I just need one. I want you to head on down to the camp of the Assyrians. The Bible says the Assyrian army goes to bed. And when they wake up, oh, I like the way it reads. I like what it says. It said it came to pass that night the angel of the Lord went out and smote the camp of the Assyrians. A hundred, four score, and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning... Behold, they were all dead. They woke up dead. They went to bed, aligned for victory, and then they woke up dead. Their whole plan, their whole army, every bit of the things that every, let me tell you something, church, the enemy's got plans for you, but one day he's going to wake up and his plans are going to crumble and his victory is going to fail and his battle's going to be in disarray and you're going to be victorious. I want you to lift your hands. I want you to lift your voice. I want you to declare to the enemy, you're too late. You're too late. You've been defeated already. The cross has already paid the price. Our God is not like other gods. Oh no, he stepped down into my situation. He carried a cross up Calvary's hill. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, somebody. You ought to get some victory today. You ought to say, today is going to be a different day. Today is going to be a different day. I came here with my head held low. But I'm going to leave here with victory in my hands. I'm going to leave here victorious. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. raising up a standard for somebody today cancer you will not win depression you will not win anxiety you will not win oh weeping may endure for a night but joy coming in the morning miracles when you move such an easy thing for you to do in your hand is moving right now you are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus and your voice is calling me out and right now I know you're able and my God will come through again you can do all things hallelujah you can do all things you can do all things you can do all things you never lost a battle no you never lost a battle and I know I know you Right 
now Breaking my heart of stone Taking over like this Jericho And my walls are all crashing down You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. 